So we took Sheriff apart the other day and one of the things we saw in there was that it had this backplane which all the cards connected to. So what I thought we'd do is actually have a look at how a backplane works and how it interconnects all the different cards to form a complete computer system. And what this will actually show us is how any computer works because it doesn't matter whether it's using a motherboard like your traditional computer or a backplane system. All computers, well at least all computers up to the Pentium era, are connected in this sort of fashion. We've seen the backplane physically, what does it actually look like diagrammatically is you've got a PCB and you've got various sockets on it and these are all interconnected. You'll also have some resistors on there and probably some capacitors to smooth the power supply and to terminate the ends of the bus. But effectively you've got a series of connectors which the cards can slide into and everything is then interconnected. So what sort of things are connected over those bus? Well if we have a look over here I have a descendant from one of the original Acorn system cards. This was a Control Universal Eurobeeb card, but it uses the same backplane technology as the Acorn systems use. So effectively all you've got is a series of pins, and when you plug these into the backplane, they just connect up with the socket, and then any data and anything that's sent down these wires is connected up to, to any other cards. So effectively, what are you going to send over the backplane? Well, it's basically the signals from your CPU. So you've got a 68000 CPU here. I actually took it out of an old laser writer printer. But coming out of this, you have an address bus, and we've talked about this before, and you have a data bus. And the data bus is bi-directional, so I'm just going to move the chip a bit so I can actually sort of draw another arrow. So we've got an address bus and we've got a data bus. And the way the CPU works, there's a few other control signals which go over there as well, which we'll ignore for now is whenever it wants to talk to anything in the computer, it puts an address there, and that's just a number. So we could have something at address 101010, and it will say, I want to read that address, I want to write that address. And if it's reading it, then the data is sent that way. If it's writing it, then it writes the data out. All that goes over your backplane, effectively, along with the control signals, is the address bus, and the data bus. And if you look carefully, you can see them coming off the CPU here, being connected directly to the pins on the backplane connector. Now, this is a bit odd. If you look at the original schematics for the Acorn System 1, you'll see that they had a whole load of buffer chips, which would make sure you got a strong and stable signal out over the backplane bus. One of the problems when designing these sort of things is that the, the voltage that comes out of a CPU or microprocessor is strong enough to drive a motherboard, but when you've got it going over a backplane or something, you probably want a buffer there to give a bit more strength to the signal so that it can talk to the other things. And they would have buffers so that when they send something back, the data didn't get corrupted as it was traveling along the relatively long wires. If you look at the Sun system again, you saw you had quite a wide backplane. So let's have a look at our backplane. So we've got two things. We've got an address bus, which we'll call ADDR, and we have a data bus. And we'd also have another one, which is a control bus, which would also be there. It says whether you're reading or writing, what type of data you're trying to access and so on. We're going to ignore that for now, but it would be there as well. And it connects up in exactly the same way. So if we wanted to build up a system with the backplane there, we just slide in the cars. And effectively, all you're doing is connecting that device to the address bus and the data bus. So we started off with a CPU card. So we've got a CPU there and that connects to the address bus and it connects down to the data bus like that. Now we also want some other things in there. We want to be able to use the system. So we'll probably need some memory. So we'd have a RAM card. And again, that connects to the address bus and it connects to the data bus. Probably want something else in there. We had a SCSI card in there and this again connects to the address bus and it connects to the data bus. And of course, because it's SCSI, it's got a connection to the hard disk as well. But that's a separate connection. And as far as the CPU is concerned, it only sees the SCSI card. And then the SCSI card talks to the hard disk. So it sort of talks indirectly. And you could put whatever else you wanted on there. So we could have an Ethernet card. Now, of course, there's nothing to stop the cards having other things there. If we looked at the CPU card that we had before in the Sun system, it had the CPU on there, but it also had 4 meg of RAM and it also had an Ethernet controller and some serial ports. So the cards can be multifunction, but in effect, as far as we're concerned here, we're treating it as one thing. Now, they're connected to the address bus and they're connected to the data bus. So how do they communicate? Well, they all communicate over the data bus. That's where the data is sent. But you need to make sure that only one thing is communicating at a time. Otherwise, you'll get a garbled signal on there and you wouldn't know what's happening. So the way that the CPU does that is it makes sure everything has a unique address. And so one of the things that you need to do is make sure that the RAM is only accessed when you've got one address on there. 
SCSI is only accessed when you've got another address on there and so on, depending on what you need to do. So how do you get it about doing that? So if we look at a real computer system here, now this wasn't a backplane based computer. This was the Atari ST book laptop. So it was all sort of combined onto one motherboard, but the principle is the same. The difference between this and the Sun is that with the Sun, you could swap the components around as you please to choose it. With a laptop, having the huge cards in there would perhaps be a little cumbersome. So everything was built onto the one motherboard. So the first thing we see when we look at this is that the address buses and the data bus in some cases, the address buses are different sizes. The CPU like the 68000 we have here has a 24-bit address bus. Now because it's a 16-bit CPU or presents a 16-bit data bus, you only have 23 address bus pins that you need to take out of it. So it's labeled 23 here. So we've got 23 bits worth of address space we can access. That's 16,777,216 bytes worth of memory or hardware or whatever we want to put in there. Now as we go through we can see the other things that are connected. So for example we have a system ROM but this only uses 18 bits worth of address space. So that's got 18 bits. The MIDI controller on the machine only used two bits worth as did the keyboard controller. The sound chip they haven't even drawn on the address connection there but it probably only uses two bits worth there if I remember right. Let's draw it in. It's no wonder Charlie went bust if they didn't draw their diagrams properly. This one was an interrupt and multifunctional device. It used five bits, that's 32 bytes worth of address space and so on. So how does it work? Well, the basic principle is that you decide what you want to go where in your computer. So with something like the Atari, they decided that if this was the memory, we'll use hexadecimals, that's 16 megs and this is zero. They said, right, the first four megabytes are going to be RAM. So any address between zero and what's four megabytes in hex, I think that's four zero 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 zero. I may have an extra zero in there, but it's about that sort of value. So that's going to be RAM. So any address in this range, we're going to say is RAM. What they also said is that anything roughly, and for the Atari fans in there, I am waving my hand. So all the hardware things are going to go up there. And then you had your ROM trip, which started at E0000. And that's got the operating system in. So what we can see from this is different addresses, different numbers of the location, refer to different things. So as far as the CPU is concerned, we put an address on the address bus and we're talking to something else. If we put a low address, we're talking to RAM. If we put a high address, we're talking to hardware and so on. So what the computer has to do, and in fact, what every single card has to do in a backplane system like this, is look at the address on the address bus and decide whether it's an address that's accessing it, whatever it provides, or whether it's an address for something else, in which case it ignores it. Now, how does it do that? One way I think it's really helpful to see how this works is to look at phone numbers. So in the UK, we might have a phone number like this, which will be familiar to anyone of a certain age in the UK. Anyone of an older age may expect me to have written 01811055. Oh, yes, hello, a very good morning to you. I was just reading one of the morning papers. Anyway, it doesn't matter. They're just a collection of numbers. In this case, they are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine digits long, they can vary. Computer addresses are a fixed number of binary digits. The analogy works. But this number isn't just a series of digits. It's made up of two parts. We have an area code or STD code as are known in the UK, and then the phone number within that exchange. In this case, we can split it like this. And this is our STD code, and this is the rest of the number. And what happens when you dial in to swap shop is you dial that number, the first two digit tells the exchange that you want to connect to the London exchange, and then it connects to the London exchange, and the London exchange uses the rest of the number to connect you to the BBC, and hopefully you get through to speak to Noel Edmonds. For, for the younger UK audience, obviously STD codes have changed a lot since 1980. Yeah, so yeah, this is what they were up in the 1980s. Now, as Sean rightly points out, we can change this. This doesn't have to be this. And actually, in the late 80s, they were changed. So they were actually 081. And so you had to change the exchanges to recognize that prefix. And then they could use the rest of it. But this bit didn't change. And it's exactly the same with our computer system. So our computer system has an address, say, for the ROM chip. And in this case, it's going to access in binary 1110, which is E in hexadecimal, and then some more digits. And we'll just fill these up with zeros. Except we're running out of space. It's a, this is why we use hexadecimal when we're doing computer systems, because binary numbers take up. But as far as the computer is concerned, it works in exactly the same principle as the phone number. So in the phone number, 
this is the bit that refers to something in the London Exchange, and this refers to the London Exchange, the computer works in the same way. This bit refers saying this means it's ROM, and this bit tells you where it is in the ROM. Now I could change this by just making the computer look for a different number here. And so what you need to do is have some sort of logic, and because these are zeros or ones, they can be treated as digital logic, true or false, and so on, that's true when that number is one, when that number is one, when that number is one, and that number is zero, or not one, and you add them all together, and if that's true, you know you're talking to ROM. Now if you've got a different number here, say we're talking to hardware, one, 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 da, 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 like that, so as long as your numbers are unique, you can access different things. So all you have in your system, connecting everything together, is on each of these cards, you have a bit of logic which will look at part of the address on the address bus, a certain number of bits, and say, is this the address that's been assigned to me for this card? Yes, it is. Therefore, the address and the data on the address bus are for my card. If not, then they're for one of the other cards and it ignores it. So there'll be a bit of logic there that says, is this the address that I've been assigned? If it is, then I'm going to handle it. If it isn't, then I'm not going to handle it and something else can deal with it. And if we have a look at one of the cards, if we uh, pull a card out of the system. Oops. So this is from a Sun 3160 server and it's got an ethernet connection on the back. This is the three wide Euro card. So if you look, the connectors are the same as the one we had earlier. But if you look, there's three rows of pins in there and two rows here. But if you look here, you've got a series of chips, and it's still covered in dust, and a series of dip switches that enable you to program in a specific address. And that will then set where this will appear in the computer's memory. And so you can then pop that back into the system, and it would allow you to talk to the second Ethernet card. So this approach works great on something like the Sun 3160, where you're going to mix and match cards to build a bespoke system that works just to exactly as you want it. So you put in the Ethernet cards, you want the SCSI cards, the RAM, etc. to build the system. But actually the same is true on the original IBM PC system. So if we look at the kit IBM PC I've got here, you had a series of five ISA, as they became known, extension cards where you could put in different cards to build up your system. These are the spaces here and you would just literally slot in cards like this one here, which was a network card. This is actually a slightly later one, so it's got a 16-bit extension, but this was the original card thing here. And this, again, has settings where you can set the address where you want it to appear in the memory. Now, the PC is a bit more complicated, as well as having an address space like the Motorola chips, it also has an I.O. address space, and so you could access things in two different ways, but the same principle applies. And so you would then just slot these in and it would just connect up the address buses and the data buses and the control buses in the same way. Now the interesting thing is that there's no reason why the rest of the components couldn't have been on ISA cards as well. The only reason they aren't is that most people who are going to buy a computer, like an IBM PC, are going to buy one with a CPU with RAM and so on. So it's just easy to put them all on the main board. And then you have a mini backplane equivalent here that you could slot in the extension cards, whether you wanted a monochrome graphics card or a color at the time, hard disk controller, floppy disk controller, serial port, parallel port, etc., etc. You had the same amount of flexibility. The difference was if you wanted to replace the CPU card in that, you just slid the card out, put a better one in. If you wanted to replace the CPU on here, you'd effectively have to replace the whole motherboard and it got a lot more messy, but it was a different use cases. You'd expect people to buy a computer ready built and perhaps add an extra card if they needed a network. Someone buying this knew exactly what they wanted to do and configured it to their own specification. And when are you going to finish this IBM PC? Yeah, that's a good question. When I've got some time to get soldering and stop rebuilding older systems. Now you're probably thinking, I just slot my car PCI card into the computer and it just works. Well, the trick there is that what they're actually doing is that they're working out the address of where things are based on which card it is and automatically assigning addresses and then producing a way, the sort of plug and play idea that the computer can automatically configure itself. But the same effective idea, each card will have a unique address and then they'll be accessed. Of course, on a modern PC today, the bus systems that are used look more like network connections than they do address buses and data buses, but they're still accessed from a software point of view in the same way.
Thank you.